Hello everyone, welcome to yet another session of the daily news analysis by Sri Ram's IAS where we take up the important articles featuring in the Hindu newspaper and break them down for our understanding from the UPSC examination point of view. So let's start today's discussion by taking up the important articles which are featuring in the newspaper and let's take up the first article for the day. The first article which appears in the newspaper reads India and Australia from divergence to convergence. Now this is an important editorial occurring in the newspaper on the context of the track 1.5 dialogue. This is the bilateral dialogue which happens between India and Australia which is going to take place tomorrow that is on 6th September. So in the backdrop of this multi, uh, bilateral dialogue that is going to happen between these two countries, the authors have written the editorial based on how the relationship of India and Australia has evolved and what are the areas right now which these two countries can cooperate upon. So this becomes an important topic for us from the point of view of GS2 where we study international relations. So from that perspective, this article becomes important for us. Now, as the article suggests, from divergence to convergence. So there was a point uh, in time wherein India was not uh, in much trade or cooperation with Australia due to various reasons. And therefore, India and Australia, at least in the earlier periods, were not cooperating or weren't uh, that big a trading partners. But right now, the areas of convergence between these two countries have, uh, as time is passing, they are increasing and both countries in this, uh, as, as we know, uh, uncertain economic and as well as geopolitical world, these two countries are having increasingly more and more interests in common. So let's take a look at what are those areas of convergence between India and Australia. So today a few countries in the Indo-Pacific region have more in common in both values and interests than India and Australia. So both these countries, first of all, are a part of the Indo-Pacific region. This is the region which is surrounded by the Indian Ocean and parts of the Pacific Ocean. So India and Australia are two countries which form important countries in, these, in, uh, in this Indo-Pacific region. Then apart from being two English speaking nations, both nations have English as a prominent language. They are multicultural, federal democracies. Both countries are federal democracies that believe in and respect the rule of law and both have a strategic interest in ensuring a balance in the Indo-Pacific and ensuring that the region is not dominated by any one hegemonic power. This, what is What this is indicating is towards the rise and dominance of China in the Indo-Pacific region where both countries are facing problems due to China's uh, activities and therefore both countries have strong reasons to cooperate on this front and work to make the Indo-Pacific region more rule-based and not let any one country uh, assert its dominance. And then Indians are also today the largest source of skilled migrants in Australia. We will look at a lot of examples where people migrate to Australia for better work opportunities, education opportunities. So in this way, India has become one of the largest uh, source of skilled laborers for Australia and that is where also both countries come together. So these are some of the areas which were, which have created circumstances for India and Australia to come together and therefore uh, sort of make agreements which can be important from the point of view of security for both countries, trade between two countries and other areas. So what can be the areas that both countries can cooperate on? So according to the authors, both countries are in talks on cooperating on areas such as cyber threats and artificial intelligence governance in this geopolitical turbulent region. So they are cooperating on cyber front for the, uh, dealing with cyber threats and uh, dealing with artificial intelligence governance. And then they are also dealing with how to decarbonize their economies and help each other develop trusted supply chains to critical minerals cooperation. We know that both countries are strong on their pledge to uh, decrease fossil fuels consumption and therefore the secretion of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. So both countries are cooperating as to how to decarbonize their economies and then how can India's tech talent 
can help address Australia's skill gaps through migration. So as we saw that India is already a large source of skilled labor, how the India's tech talent, which currently finds itself moving mostly to United States of America and uh, other regions such as uh, of the Europe and UK, but how that talent can be better supplied to states like Australia will be a point which could be favor for uh, in favor for both countries. So they are working on that as well. And Australia wants to find alternative markets to China and diversify supply chains for its critical minerals. Now this is a major development that has happened wherein Australia and China, the trade relationship between these two countries has taken a shift or has uh, sort of one can say taken a hit in the past few years and therefore Australia is keen to develop alternatives to China and therefore India is coming out to be one such alternative where Australia wants to deal uh, in trade with uh, other partners and India can be one and this area especially with respect to the critical minerals. These minerals which are rare earth minerals or other minerals, these are used in various applications, uh, industrial applications in various industries. So as a country with reserves of about 21 of the 49 minerals identified in India's critical mineral strategy, so whichever uh, critical minerals India needs, Australia has 21 of them out of the 49 and therefore Australia is well placed to serve India's national interest required for India's carbon reduction program. So by supplying these critical minerals which would be applied in these new age technologies such as the electric vehicle technology and other electrical appliances and other industries, the load on the carbon uh, footprint would be decreased and that is how both India and Australia can work together and cooperate on these new age areas so that their trade is also intensified and the security aspects of the Indo-Pacific region which has become, become a major theatre in terms of power projection and trade uh, and China is increasingly asserting its dominance in this region, both countries can come together and play a major role in maintaining security in this region and also diversify their trade relationship. And soon the bilateral free trade agreement between India and Australia is expected to take place and who knows the ministers and the dignitaries which will meet in India Australia meet uh, tomorrow might uh, make major developments in that direction as well. So with this we finish this article and let's move on to our next article for the day. The next article which appears in the newspaper reads dark sky reserve to come up in Ladakh. Now this is an important article which features in the newspaper which talks about the concept of dark sky reserve which is coming up in the region of Hanle in Ladakh. Now this is the Himalayan Chandra telescope at Hanle. First of all let's take a look at where is Hanle in Ladakh. So in this union territory of uh, Ladakh this is the region which is known as Hanle. This region has a number of telescopes like we saw in the photo this is the Himalayan Chandra telescope and the Gamma telescope as well. These telescopes are located at a region which makes the observers uh, situate at a very good vantage point for observing the sky and this region of Ladakh, the Hanle region is said to be a very very prominent and a good site for such explorations and therefore in line with this uh, quality of this region a dark sky reserve is also being established in this region. So we'll, uh, from this article, we'll try to understand the importance of Hanle, the location which is having so many telescopes and now a dark sky reserve is also going to be situated in this region and what exactly is a dark sky reserve. So this topic becomes important for us from the perspective of science and technology in GS3. right? So let's take a look at what do we mean by a dark sky reserve. What is a dark sky reserve? So a dark sky reserve is nothing but an area usually surrounding a park or observatory that restricts artificial light pollution. So basically a dark sky reserve whenever we talk about a tiger reserve or any such uh, areas we are basically keeping it for the conservation of these wild animals like the tigers or other animals. Similarly, a dark sky reserve is an area reserved for those kind of activities 
which should facilitate uh, ob uh, observation of the sky of the night sky and that is why the these areas are those areas which are most suitable for such observation and therefore these reserves will have stringent provisions so that artificial light pollution does not occur in these areas and therefore the region of hanle which already has uh, an observatory situated in ladakh has been selected as the area for dark sky reserve so in 1993 michigan in usa became the first state in us to designate a tract of land as a dark sky reserve at the lake hudson state recreational area so usa was the first country and uh, which designated a certain area as the dark sky reserve and there are many such dark sky reserves all over the world but this in ladakh would be the first dark sky reserve a uh, uh, dark sky reserve in india this would be the first one in india and it is generally understood that a dark sky reserve should be sufficiently dark to promote astronomy however this is not always the case the lighting protocol for a dark sky reserve is based on the sensitivity of wildlife to artificial light at night so various factors are considered while designating a track of area as a dark sky reserve so what is the objective now of this reserve uh, these this kind of a reserve has been designated in ladakh what would be, what would be the objective so the objective or the purpose of the dark sky mo uh, movement is generally to promote astronomy so the primary motive of designating a dark sky reserve in this ladakh region is basically done to facilitate astronomical activities and also promote astro tourism when an area is designated for night sky observation activities the tourist act uh, uh, who are also coming to that region in with the intention of uh, experiencing this kind of observation of the night sky is set to promote astro tourism in that region and this is were called as one of the major steps taken to uh, establish this dark sky reserve so this has been the objective and apart from astronomy various other aspects which are related to the dark night sky can be fulfilled so therefore a dark night sky is associated with so many facets of history philosophy religion societal development poetry song mathematics and science and therefore to further all these uh, objectives and interests in these areas the dark sky reserve is situated uh, is is established and it would promote tourism and exploration in all these fields now we come to india's first site for the dark site reserve so as we saw it is situated in hanle in ladakh so this is also the part of the changtang wildlife sanctuary this dark sky reserve is a small part of the Changtang Wildlife Sanctuary at Hanle in Ladakh and is all set to become India's first dark sky reserve. It will promote astronomy tourism giving a boost to local tourism through science. This is a very good move which is taken in terms of uh, sort of protecting and encouraging observation activities for the scientists as well and also at the same time promote astro tourism. People who are interested in observing the night sky and knowing more about all of this. so therefore the reason for selecting the site for the program is that ladakh holds great potential for undertaking un uninterrupted astronomical observations because this site is located at a height of 4500 meters hanle is already home to optical gamma ray and infrared telescopes for space exploration and therefore this region of hanle is being said and is being observed as the best region where the night sky is the best because it is at a certain height also from the sea level and it gives a, an uninterrupted view of the night sky that is why this uh, site of hanle in ladakh has been chosen now what is this dark sky reserve the hanle dark sky reserve so this would be an area spanning 22 kilometers in radius centered around the hanle observatory so the that that uh, the observatory that we saw around it a 22 km area would be known as the hanle dark sky reserve and both locals and tourists have to follow regulations that will be imposed on the outdoor lighting as we saw this reserve will have stringent provisions on curbing artificial light pollution so there would be stringent provisions on outdoor lighting use of high beam vehicles light shields and curtains among 
other measures to cut down light pollution and under the observatory the administration local council members along with scientists will collectively work towards preservation of the night sky from unwanted light pollution and illumination and therefore carry out these observatory works within this dark sky reserve so this becomes an important topic especially from our prelims uh, examination and with this we finish this discussion and let's move on to our next article for the day the next article which appears in the newspaper reads 14 year long wait ends for andhra pradesh farmers now why this article is being featured is because what is meant by 14 year long wait ending for the andhra pradesh farmers is the establishment of two barrages the nellore pena and mgr sangam barrages which have been built by the andhra pradesh government along the penna river which is also called penna river or penna river so this becomes an important river since rivers are frequently asked in the upsc prelims examination so we'll try to take a look at important points with respect to the penna river and why is it why is it important because the andhra pradesh government has recently built two barrages or what kind of dams as uh, one can understand to facilitate the water distribution in that region that is why the farmers are going to benefit from the con uh, construction of these barrages so in this context let's take a look at important points with respect to the penna river this river is an east flowing river which rises in the eastern ghats and the water is shared between the states of karnataka and andhra pradesh this river the river basin majorly lies in the state of andhra pradesh and partly in the state of karnataka so let's take a look at the important points with respect to river pennar the river pennar also known as uttar pinakini is one of the major rivers of the indian peninsula and it rises in the chenna keshava hill of the nandidurg range so the nandidurg hill range the chenna keshava hill is the origin point of pennar river so if we trace it in the map this region becomes the origin point for pennar river and then in this is in the chikbalpura district of karnataka so we should remember that the pennar river is rising in the state of karnataka in the nandidurg hill range and then it flows towards east eventually draining into the bay of bengal then it enters the state of andhra pradesh and then eventually drains into the bay of bengal the total length of the river from origin to its outfall in the bay of bengal is 597 km so it's a 597 long river located in peninsular india the basin extends over states of andhra pradesh and karnataka having an area of more than 55000 square km that becomes the area of its basin the fan shaped basin is bounded by the eramala range on the north these are the mountain ranges which the river is abounded by so in the north it is bounded by the eramala range by the nallamalla and velikonda ranges of the eastern ghats on the east and by the nandidurg hills which is also the origin point on the south and by the narrow ridge separating it from the vedavati valley of the krishna basin on the west so these are the hill ranges which it which it is bounded by the other hill ranges in the basin to the south of the river are the seshachalam of which is famous for the red sanders or the red sandalwood uh, this kind of red sandalwood is only found in the forest ranges of seshachalam and therefore and uh, in the palikonda ranges as well so these are the various mountain ranges these ranges small mountain ranges which belong to the eastern ghats are surrounded in the states of uh, andhra pradesh and karnataka and this penna river flows between all these mountain ranges and the major part of the basin is covered with agriculture accounting to 58.64% of the total area so major activities that this river supports is obviously the agricultural activities that is why the farmers are going to benefit from the construction of these barrages right and then what are the tributaries of this river so the major left bank tributaries of the river are jayamangli and the kunderu and the right bank are the chiravati and papagni 
let's take a look at the tributaries of the river so we can see the pennar is flowing from karnataka and through andhra pradesh into the bay of bengal and papagni and chitravati become the right bank tributaries and kunderu and rivers such as sagileru become the left bank tributaries for the river so these are the important points which we should be remembering with respect to the pennar river with this we finish the discussion for this article and let's move on to the next article for the day the next article in the newspaper reads the international monetary funds staff level agreement with sri lanka now this article is featuring in the newspaper because as we all know sri lanka is facing a massive economic crisis where it does not have enough forex reserve to pay back its increasingly mounting debt and therefore a severe economic crisis has engulfed the nation and the price levels of basic food commodities fuels and other uh, products have skyrocketed and the lives of people have gotten into immense danger and this is where sri lankan government was trying to negotiate with the international monetary fund for the past many months for it to grant a loan so that it can come out of this crisis and in the recent days the imf or the international monetary fund has agreed to grant sri lanka such a loan and it has agreed to grant a loan of rupees 2.9 billion dollars to sri lanka now the question remains for us to understand is that how enough would this 2.9 billion dollar loan be for the sri lankan government and from the examination point of view how does this system of loan granting of the imf to nations work because as we know a similar kind of loan was granted by the imf to india in the year 1991 which we uh, co uh, colloquially referred to as the lpg reforms uh, liberalization privatization and globalization reforms which took place in 1991 india faced a similar balance of payments crisis where india also did not have enough forex reserves and in that case imf granted india the loan but we need to understand that whenever imf grants a loan to a certain country to help the country out it lays down certain conditions on that country which say that that yes we are granting you the loan but we have certain conditions that you must fulfill before we grant you the loan so we'll take a look at what conditions imf has laid down on the sri lankan government so as we saw this is the 2.9 billion dollar loan which the staff level meeting of the uh, international monetary fund has agreed to grant sri lanka let's take a look at background on sri lanka's current financial turmoil we saw how sri lanka is facing a problem exactly what kind of a problem sri lanka is facing let's take a look at that it, sri lankans have faced acute short, shortages of fuel and other basic goods that we are seeing and unprecedented protests that forced a change in government this is also has been the change turn of events in the past few months where protesters even stormed president's house and president had to fly to uh, fl fly away from the country fly from the country and uh, eventually he had landed to maldives and then singapore so protests are also on the rise that inflation is on massive rise at almost 65% where food inflation inflation rose to 93% which means that almost 100% price rise is seen in the price of products and uh, essential commodities so inflation is is on the rise and country's forex reserves stood at 1.82 billion dollars so it has only 1.82 billion dollars as forex reserves to buy any uh, imports or any you make use of any uh, forex reserves for for its purposes so this shows the dwindling forex reserves for sri lanka and it, if we talk about the debt that sri lanka has sri lanka needs to restructure nearly 30 billion dollars of its debt uh, the newspaper article also suggests that sri lanka has over 50 billion dollar debt uh, which it owes to various countries and other multilateral and bilateral institutions which grant such loans so we can see the extent of the crisis over here where it has to restructure 30 billion dollars of its debt it has a, a, a collective debt of more than 50 billion dollars and the kind of loan it is getting from the imf is around 
2.9 billion dollars so this tells us this gives us a picture as to how useful this loan can be in the long term picture for sri lanka where it has a long way to go to deal with this crisis but it is said that at least this is a start to uh, sri lanka's uh, curing of its problems so now sri lanka will also need to strike a deal with international banks and asset managers that hold the majority of its 19 billion worth of sovereign bonds which are now classified as in default so this becomes a part of the conditions of the imf as i was telling earlier that while granting this loan imf has laid down certain conditions on sri lanka let's take a look at what those conditions are now let's take a look at the agreement what is saying now the staff level agreement which the imf has uh, in in which the imf has agreed to grant loan to sri lanka is the beginning of a long road ahead for sri lanka to emerge from the crisis and the agreement is subject to approval by imf management and its executive board and is contingent on sri lankan authorities following through which previously agreed measures and now we come to the conditions that the imf has laid down on sri lanka so what is the condition first is that receiving financing assurances from sri lanka's official creditors and efforts by the country to reach an agreement with private creditors so first condition that the imf has laid down on sri lanka is that that you will receive financing assurances from your creditors so whoever has given sri lanka debt be those the other countries such as china japan india india has also given 4 billion dollars worth of relief in debt and other sources to sri lanka so first condition is that sri lanka will uh, get fin uh, financial assurances from all its creditors and its program will aim to boost government revenue encourage fiscal consolidation so whatever loan that imf will be giving it should be used by sri lankan government to enhance its revenue to encourage fiscal consolidation introduce new pricing for fuel and electricity hike social spending bolster central bank autonomy and rebuild depleted foreign reserves these are the positive conditions laid down by the imf on sri lankan government wherein it is stipulating that apart from granting the loan it is also giving conditions as to how this loan amount should be used by sri lanka then this program will also implement major tax reforms so major tax reforms are also to be implemented by sri lanka as a condition to the loan these reforms include making personal income tax more progressive and broadening the tax base for corporate income tax and the value added tax this means that the tax base which uh, should be increased which will increase the government's revenue that it is earning then the next is that this program aims to reach a primary surplus of 2.3% of gdp by 2024 and sri lanka also has to increase social spending that is it's the amount it is spending on the social security measures then with respect to other multilateral creditors those other organizations which have given loan to sri lanka once the imf package is approved sri lanka is also likely to receive further financial support from these other multilateral creditors and the two objectives of these new program are to restore macroeconomic stability and debt sustainability in the country while safeguarding financial stability protecting the vulnerable and stepping up the structural reforms to address corruption vulnerabilities and unlock sri lanka's growth potential this can be said as the vision of imf within its condition to uplift the position of sri lanka wherein not just the loan amount but certain positive steps should also be taken with respect to sri lanka's economy so that the stage and he, uh, financial health of sri lanka is better uh, from the present and its the future of sri lanka is better and to do that all these steps are necessary then rebuilding foreign reserves is important obviously the foreign reserves are depleting that is why they need to be rebuilt through restoring a market determined and flexible exchange rate then to safeguard financial stability by ensuring a healthy and adequately capitalized banking system which means that the banks should be infused with enough capital and then corruption should be reduced through improving fiscal transparency and public financial management 
corruption in the sri lankan administration has been a major reason for the crisis that it is facing and therefore the imf envisages curbing of this corruption activities to make financial uh, sri lanka's financial health better this is the uh, conditions which are uh, en uh, enrolled by the imf to sri lanka and now what about the other countries uh, how are they reacting to imf's agreement so china which is one of the bigger players to give debt to sri lanka is a traditional friendly neighbor of sri lanka and a major shareholder of the imf and it has always been encouraged to play a positive role in supporting sri lanka's response to current difficulties efforts to ease debt burden and realize sustainable development but as we see that sri lanka's response to its various creditors be that china japan or india has been a uh, one can say at least from the indian point of view partial and that is why india highlighted that it has been advocating for assistance to sri lanka it itself gave a loan to sri lanka but it is facing issues of creditor equitability which means that the same kind of treatment should be given to all its creditors is what india is advocating and therefore transparency and creditor equitability treating all creditors equal is very important and therefore prior to nearly 4 billion dollar loan that india extended recently in the wake of the crisis sri lanka owed about 960 million dollars to india which is the earlier amount of loan before the crisis therefore what is the way forward it is important for the government of sri lanka in collaboration with the imf and paris club to work for the betterment of its economic and fiscal situation while securing transparency so that all the creditors that are in a uh, Uh, that that are in china uh, sri lanka to help it, it they should all be satisfied and this crisis that sri lanka is facing it is able to get out of it at the earliest so the, we finished the discussion on this article over here and we finished to the, today's discussion for the important articles and lastly before we go today's teachers day uh, we wish you a very happy teachers day from sri rams is and uh, maybe uh, may you enjoy the day and we finish the discussion Uh, over here today and we'll meet again tomorrow with the important articles from the newspaper thank you sir band karna hota hai